Hi everyone. In today's video, I'm going to be going through the baroreceptor reflex. And the baroreceptor reflex is one of the key reflexes that is required in allowing for both a lowering of blood pressure and an increase in blood pressure. So as you can imagine, the stimuli for both of these steps will be the opposite to what they actually do. Now the baroreceptor reflex is important to know because it is essentially the short-term method of controlling blood pressure within the body. Unlike the kidneys which actually change the blood volume and therefore allow for a long-term control of blood pressure, the baroreceptors which are located usually in the carotid bodies and at the bifurcation of the thoracic aorta uh, when it splits off into the va uh, various other great vessels, they allow for simply a change in vasomotor tone, so the essentially the processes of both vasoconstriction and vasodilation, as opposed to actual physical changes in volume of the blood. So since this mechanism is such a short-term mechanism and its process is not very systemic, it has certain limitations. The main and most probably noticeable limitation of the baroreceptor reflex is that it's not very adaptable and it's not very stable, I should say. What that means is that, say for example, a person has their baroreceptors set so that the baroreceptors try to maintain blood pressure as close to 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury as much as possible. Say for example that person becomes sedentary, uh, takes up smoking, and eventually all of these risk factors contribute them to having high blood pressure or hypertension. If that hypertension occurs for a long enough period of time, what can actually happen is that the baroreceptors can be reset by the body to a higher blood pressure. So say for example, the normal, or the, I should say in inverted commas, the normal blood pressure for that person now becomes 140 on 90 millimeters of mercury. The baroreceptors will be set on that new level and try to maintain blood pressure on that new higher set value. So that subsequently means that essentially the baroreceptors are working against the physiological level of 120 on 80 millimeters of mercury and therefore causing damage to the body. On the flip side, if that person stops all of those modifiable risk factors and returns back to a normal blood pressure, then yes, the body will return to a baroreceptor set limit of 120 on 80 once again. But it's important to remember that this process does take time and it is likely that even though a person exercises and eats well that their blood pressure still remains high and in some cases it may not ever return to normal and in that case they may have to be started on medications such as ACE inhibitors which are the first line treatment to be used for hypertension. So now that we've been introduced a little bit to the baroreceptors and their reflex, let's look at the diagram on the slide here. This diagram shows a feedback loop that allows for the management of blood pressure within the body. Let's first look at the top half of the diagram that looks at what happens if there is an increase in blood pressure. As number one states, the stimulus in this case, as I've mentioned before, is an increase in blood pressure and that arterial blood pressure rises above the normal set range. So say for example, the set value for the baroreceptors is 120 on 80. These baroreceptors will be activated when the blood pressure goes above that particular value. So what's its increase? If we look at number two, the baroreceptors in the carotid sinuses and aortic arch are stimulated. And eventually, these baroreceptors are essentially modified nerve cells. And once they allow for, or once they 
see that the blood pressure has been increased, the modified nerve receptors send nerve impulses from blood vessels to the brain. So as seen in number three, there is an increased amount of impulses from the baroreceptors to stimulate the cardioinhibitory center and therefore inhibit the cardioaccelerotory center and also inhibit the vasomotor sensor. So in step three, there are a lot of things happening and let's first run through what is actually happening and why it's happening. So firstly, the brain is receiving an increased amount of motor or I should say just nervous innovation from the baroreceptors. So that's the first step that's happening. And essentially, if there's an increase in the frequency of nerve impulses from the baroreceptors, we get what's called an increase or stimulation of the cardioinhibitory center. And as the name suggests, the cardioinhibitory center is a part of the brain which allows for stopping or a ceasing of various sympathetic processes within the heart and it also allows for an activation of parasympathetic processes so if we activate the cardio inhibitory center we will see both a reduction in the contractility of the heart as well as re a reduction in the heart rate at the same time if we inhibit the cardio accelerotory center which is the part in brackets we will see that a reduction in sympathetic nervous system activation of the heart will take place and this will have similar effects and essentially accelerate the effects that the parasympathetic nervous system has on the heart so what that means is that essentially there will be a reduction in contractility and a further reduction in the heart rate which was already stimulated by the parasympathetic nervous system so these are the effects that we are seeing in number 4a. A reduction in sympathetic impulses to the heart causes a decrease in heart rate and a decrease in contractility and that subsequently causes a decrease in cardiac output. Now the formula that defines cardiac output is when there is a multiplication of the heart rate via or, or by the stroke volume. Now the heart rate, we already know, has been decreased because we saw that a decreased sympathetic innovation of the heart causes a decrease in heart rate. But what causes for, an in, for a decrease sorry, in stroke volume? Well, if we decrease the contractility, which is the amount at which the heart contracts per heartbeat, we can see that it essentially pumps out less blood with each heartbeat. So that means that the stroke volume will be decreased as well because the amount of blood with each heartbeat that is leaving the heart is decreased. So that means that in this formula, if both heart rate and stroke volume are decreased, then cardiac output has to decrease as well. The last effect that we see in the brain here is an inhibition of the vasomotor center. Now the vasomotor center is a part of the brain in which there is control of the vasodilatory and vasoconstrictive processes of blood vessels. And as we all know, blood vessels already have a certain amount of control in which they are kept in sympathetic tone. Uh, and essentially, blood vessels are always tensed to some extent. So if we inhibit the vasomotor center, what that essentially means is that we're allowing for a reduction in the sympathetic tone and therefore, there is a, an increase in the vasodilation that is occurring within these blood vessels. That is essentially a parasympathetic process. And that means that more blood can flow through the blood vessels. But at the same time, since there is a dilation, we have the same amount of blood volume flowing through a larger container. So there is a decrease in blood pressure. So as we see in 4b, a decreased rate of vasomotor impulses causes for vasodilation. And since there is, in terms of blood volume, a less amount of blood coming in contact with the walls, because if we think about it, if we have a blood vessel lumen that is this big, then a lot of blood is going to be in contact with the blood vessel like that. 
and there is only going to be a little amount that is not in contact. But if we increase the lumen size of the blood vessel, then yes, there may be an increase in the amount of blood touching the walls, but we have this large area in the middle that is not being touched by the blood uh, or not touching the blood vessel wall. So that means that there is a lower resistance. So the final effects that occur on the overall cardiovascular system is that as seen in number five, there is a reduction in cardiac output and resistance, which means that blood pressure is returned to a normal homeostatic range. And this homeostatic range is defined by whatever the baroreceptors are set at. And let's assume that in this case, they're set at 120 over 80. Now let's look at what happens on the flip side when there is a reduction in blood pressure. And essentially what happens here is the opposite of what we see when there is an increase or hypertension occurring. So as we saw in number one, the stimulus in this case is a decrease in blood pressure, which means that there is a decreased arterial blood pressure, which falls below the normal range of 120 on 80. That subsequently means that baroreceptors are inhibited because if there is a reduction in blood pressure, then they aren't being activated to the same extent in terms of their nerve impulse quality. That subsequently means that there is a reduction in the number of impulses reaching from the baroreceptors to the brain. And I hope you're noticing here that essentially if we want to allow for an activation of the cardio inhibitory center, we need to increase the amount of nerve impulses going from the baroreceptors to the brain. So the main stimulus to allow for activation of that cardio inhibitory center is actually an increase in motor or nervous innovation of the baroreceptors. So if we have a decreased amount of nerve impulses going from the baroreceptors to the brain, then we have a inhibition of the cardio inhibitory center as seen in the brackets. And we also activate the cardio accelerator center and stimulate the vasomotor sensor. So if we think about it, the increased activation of the baroreceptors essentially allows for a decrease or inhibition or blocking of the cardio inhibitory, sorry, I should say the cardio accelerator and the vasomotor centers. So what effect does that have on the cardiovascular system? Well, on the heart, if we activate the cardio accelerator center, we're going to see an increase in contractility and heart rate. And the factors that define heart rate and contractility um, eventually lead to cardiac output. So that means that cardiac output is increased. And if we activate the vasomotor center as well, we see that there is a process of vasoconstriction occurring. And as I've explained in these two diagrams here, if there is vasoconstriction, there is going to be an increase in blood vessel resistance because more blood is coming in contact with the blood vessel wall. So that eventually means that there is an increase in cardiac output and an increase in resistance, as I mentioned before, and therefore blood pressure is increased as to allow for the return of that blood pressure back to homeostatic levels. Now, a key application of the baroreceptors, which is something that I want to end this video with, is what we encounter in our everyday life. Whenever you go from a sitting position, say if you've been sitting down for a long time, to standing up, what prevents you from essentially fainting because of that sudden increase, uh, or sorry, decrease in blood pressure is the baroreceptor reflex. Because what happens when you go from sitting to standing is that all the blood in your cardiovascular system goes from being on that chair to now being higher than that level of the chair. And what that causes is that your cardiovascular system isn't able to adapt to that process fast enough and you risk causing hyperperfusion of the brain. Now since the baroreceptors are nerve receptors, 
they act very quickly and they sense that there is hyperperfusion of the brain and subsequent tissues occurring and that causes for this entire mechanism to occur in essentially milliseconds. It activates the brain to cause for an increase in vasomotor tone and heart rate to allow for a proper adjustment such that the blood pressure is increased to an extent that is viable and allows for the person who goes from a sitting to standing position uh, without fainting. This is counteracted when a patient is taking drugs such as antihypertensive because their blood pressure remains so low that the body is unable to adapt and therefore a common side effect of a lot of medications that are taken for hypertension are fainting and that's called orthostatic fainting because when you're moving from a sitting to standing position you're changing the position of your body. So that's something to keep in mind as a clinical application and clinical relevance of baroreceptors and their subsequent reflexes. So I hope this video has made sense for you today and thank you very much for watching.